we're very uh, happy to have come back and uh, speak with us again. He's going to talk to us about the adventures of Thomas Corcoran. Uh, he was an early pioneer and resident of Angel's Camp during the 1848 uh, gold rush. And he uh, is going to talk about his journey along the Oregon and California trails and his life as a supplier of goods. And uh, a little bit about Mike. He is a retired attorney who graduated from the University of California, Davis Law School. And he has, he found himself constantly drawn to the history of the Far West, especially in the era of the covered wagon and the immigrant trail. And uh, we want to welcome Mike again and uh, thank you so much for coming. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, it's my pleasure again to be here. Some of you may have been here two years ago when I was here last, and at that time I was, um, my presentation had to do with the very first wagon party uh, to California, the Bartleson Bidwell Party of 1841. And they came over the Sierras and came down out of the mountains right about where Sonora is. Uh, when I gave that presentation here two years ago, I did kind of wrap it up by saying, well, maybe someday I'll get invited back here I would love to tell you about Thomas Corcoran, who's a great, great, great uncle of mine, who came to California on a wagon party in 1848 and met up with his friends, the Murphy family. Um, and of course, that's what the town of Murphy's is named after, is those guys. And uh, he settled, uh, Thomas settled in this area and um, became quite a big merchant to the mining camps. And so I've got a few things to tell you about him. I thought you'd find him interesting since he is a pioneer of this area. I've said before, I could probably spend three hours telling you the story of Thomas's adventures in coming across the plains to California and his time here. But you guys are like me, you can't sit for much more than an hour. So I've tried to squeeze it down into about a one hour presentation Please forgive me if I creep over a little bit. I hope not to. Um, but um, I'm going to have to leave a lot of really interesting stuff out. But I'll try and hit the highlights and the stuff that you might find the most interesting. All right, this is a picture of Thomas. Uh, it was taken of him in 1875 when he lived down on a ranch near Stockton. And he was a member of the San Joaquin County Society of California Pioneers and in 1875 they took photographs of all of their members and those photographs are in the archives at the Hagen Museum in Stockton and that's how I found that picture was uh, going through the Hagen Museum. It was the only picture I had ever up until that point in time had ever seen of him. Um, I descend from an older brother of Thomas's, a uh, fellow by the name of Owen Corcoran and uh, I'm pleased to announce that we have the pleasure of being in our crowd today, some descendants of Thomas. Um, Rosie, you want to stand up and introduce yourself and your siblings? Okay. Uh, very happy to be here. Thanks, Mike. Okay. And my brother, Mike. Yeah. And my sister, Cecilia. Okay. I've talked to Rosie, we've made connections a few years ago, and I've talked to Rosie a couple of times on the phone. This is my first chance to meet them face-to-face uh, -face for the first time. And they're of the same generation as my mother. Uh, but what's it, so I was trying to figure out one time, what are they, my fourth cousins? Well, actually, they'd be third cousins to my mother. But what's more interesting about it is that the two brothers, Owen Corcoran and Thomas Corcoran, married two sisters. So we've kind of doubled up, you know, so there's a double concentration of genes there. All right, let me get started. Um, I, what I want to do, I'm going to try and cover basically three segments. I'm going to start off with um, the history of the Corcoran family a little bit, what brought them to America, 
uh, how it is that Thomas came to come across the country with a wagon party to come into California in 1848. And then I'll finally wrap it up with his years, Thomas's years in this general area from roughly San Andreas down to Jamestown and Sonora in those early, early years. Um, Thomas Corcoran's family um, were from Ireland. They were uh, a family of 10 children. Uh, the parents were Francis and Anastasia Corcoran and they left uh, Ireland in 1828 and settled in Quebec. And they ended up living in a community 30 miles south of uh, Quebec City called Frampton. And Frampton actually in the late 1820s, early 1830s was a community of Irish immigrants. And they tried to farm, scratch a, far, a, a living out of that rather cold, harsh climate, pretty rocky soils. It wasn't really the easiest place for them to make a living. So a number of them heard that in the very end of the 1830s that the US government had just purchased two million acres uh, in northwest Missouri uh, called the Platte Purchase from a number of Indian tribes. They paid the Indian tribes uh, two million dollars for that. And um, this land was going to be made available for um, for settlement and homesteading. And so um, the, the family, uh, the Corcoran family, the Murphy family, the Sullivan family, and I'm sure there were a few others, um, chose to move down there. And so it was about in 1840 that those families came into Missouri, settled on this area. Um, and so <clears throat> what I'm going to do from time to time, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about information from the Corcorans. And much of this information that I'll be telling you came from letters that Thomas had when he got to California, he started writing to his sister Elizabeth. And in those letters, he would describe events that happened on his journey to California and others. And we're very fortunate as a family that those letters, when they were sent to Elizabeth, who at the time lived in Wisconsin, Elizabeth kept those letters. And they passed down through a number of generations uh, up until the current time. And a member of the family, um, a number of years ago, went back and transcribed all those letters and then had copies made and distributed among extended family members. And about 20 years ago, my mom gave me a copy of those. And that's how, what got me really started in learning about Thomas and led to my interest in the subject matter of the Oregon Trail. Um, because when I would read those letters, I was fascinated. When I finally re retired and had some free time for the first time in my life, I wanted to learn more about Thomas's adventures and especially his trip across the West. And over time, I began to accumulate more and more narratives of people that came to California in 1848. And there's not a lot of those narratives. In fact, Western historians describe 1848 as the lost year because it was the year before the gold rush. As you know, gold was discovered in California in January of 1848, but news of it did not get back into the East until later in 1848. So the wagon parties that left Missouri in the spring of 1848 had no knowledge of the discovery of gold in California. But over time, I was able by collecting books, collecting copies of diaries uh, and other memoirs that were written by people that came out in 1848. We ended up with about nine narr narrators. And I was able to obtain copies of all of these narratives. And in doing so, you could kind of piece together the long chain of wagon parties that were came, coming west in 1848. And, and, and we discovered there were about 17 different separate wagon parties that headed west that year. 15 of them were going to Oregon, only two to California. And again, it was because no one knew at the time that gold had been discovered. So the parties that were going to California in 1848 were going to California for other reasons. And Thomas would have been in the first of those two parties. So that's what got me started. And um, I'm going to show you an image. This would be an image of Elizabeth. That would be Thomas's sister. 
who was living in Wisconsin at the time that he wrote the letters to. <clears throat> that is the book that I ended up producing um, in 2011, about 10 years ago. <laughs> there was so much material I found, the book ended up 550 pages long. And it was published by Truman State University Press in Missouri. And as has happened with a lot of university presses, many of them have just shut their doors. They've gone out of business. And Truman State has. So of the, all of the original books that were printed of immigrants, um, it's now out of print. And there's probably 1,500 copies scattered around the country. And if you go on Amazon, it shows the book, but you can't order it through Amazon. It is available through some used book dealers, and um, uh, it's being priced at between $60 and $100 a copy right now. Well, since Truman State's out of business and they own the rights to the book, I have to acquire the uh, rights back again from them, and my hope in the next number of months is to eventually get printing it again. All I have in my possession right now are 27 books, and they're with a distributor of mine. If anybody wants to buy a copy of this book, uh, up to 20-some books, you, you'll be able to, uh, what I'll do, I'll, I'll set out a, uh, uh, a tablet out here, and you can write your name and address, and then I'll get the distributor to mail the book to you, which will charge $20 for it, and plus shipping, whatever the shipping will be. And then I've already, because I, I just love these people here at Angel's Camp and their museum, I, I will, for every book that's sold, I'm going to send them $10 for every book that's sold. All right. All right, now I'm going to go back to the, the Corcoran family and show you where, where they settled in Missouri. Okay, down here in this map, and I, and I apologize, you're, many of you are probably not going to be able to see the detail. Uh, if your eyesight's no better than mine. Uh, this is where Kansas City, Missouri would be, Independence, Missouri, and this is the Missouri River. And up about here is Irish Grove, and up here would be where Omaha, Nebraska is. And then there's a little community there called Bellevue, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. The, the, the Irish that left Frampton, including Mike Corcoran's, settled here at um, Irish Grove. And it wasn't a town. It was just a community of these Irish that settled there and were going to seek getting homesteads on land there. And because they were all Irish, it just came to be known as Irish Grove. Um, this is a, a Google Earth image of the area. Uh, this would be the Missouri River. This, from here to here, would be the Missouri River Plain, and then it's about four miles wide on average, and then above the plain are these bluffs that are about 100, 150 feet above the surrounding plain. And this is the Irish Grove area, and this is where the Corcoran Farm was. I've been there a couple of times. That's a photograph of where the Corcoran family settled. This would have been part of their farm. You can see it's kind of rough and uneven, um, but it was a you know, better, longer growing season than they experienced in Frampton, Quebec. Um, the soil was less rocky, probably better quality soil. But, but the Irish families there discovered a major problem, and that was malaria. Um, the Missouri River uh, produced tons and tons of mosquitoes, and those mosquitoes carried with them the malaria virus and virtually infected everybody that lived there. And so although that group settled there in 1840, uh, pretty soon many of them were very sick with malaria. And the patriarch of the uh, Murphy family, Martin Murphy Sr., he lost his wife and a granddaughter to malaria about 1843. And there was a Jesuit priest there by the name of Father Hoken, who was a mission missionary priest with the Indians in the area, but he also catered to this Irish community since they were all Catholic. And he urged, um, urged them maybe they wanna, should consider moving to California. Uh, and at that time in 1843, 1844, California was still belonged to Mexico. 
He said it was a more healthful climate, and he said, it's a Catholic country. So Martin Murphy Sr. and uh, the Sullivan family and, and their, their families decided they were going to go to California. And so they, they did. They traveled, they traveled up the uh, Missouri River again to Belleville. This is in eight, the spring of 1844. So they traveled Irish Grove up here to Bellevue. And um, this is an image of Belleville, which about that time was nothing more than a trading post and a Methodist missionary or mission. And a party formed that was going to go to California. It was called the Stevens Townsend Party. And they hired an old mountain man by the name of Caleb Greenwood. He was a former fur trapper who had um, been traveled the trail back into the Rocky Mountains quite regularly, and he was hired to be their guide. And so in the spring of 1844, the Townsend, or Stevens Townsend party, together with the Murphy family and the Sullivan family, set out with their wagons for California. And that party was the very first party to succeed in getting wagons into California over Donner Pass in 1844. So we're going to hear about the Murphy's family a little more later. This is a chart that kind of puts into context these years. This came from a book that had been written a number of years ago about the Oregon Trail. And you'll see that in the very early years, 1840, nobody went to California. 1841, that was the year of the Bartleson Party when actually 32 people came into California. 1842, no one came to California. People were starting to migrate to Oregon. They'd heard about what a wonderful valley the Willamette Valley was. 1843, there was one party. In 1844, this is the Stevens Townsend party that the Murphys and the Sullivans came out on. 1845, there were a few more parties. 1846 was a, a landmark year because there was a lot of wagon parties that came out that year. The last wagon party, of course, was the Donner Party, the ones that got trapped in the snows of Donner Pass. Following year, they dropped off considerably, and now we're gonna be talking about 1848 when these two wagon parties came to California, the one that Thomas Corcoran came out on, this number is probably a little high, probably was more like 250 to 300 people came. Then, of course, by then, word spread about the discovery of gold, and as you can see, the numbers just exploded starting in 1849 and 1850. Now, in the spring of 1848, Thomas Corcoran, a young man of only about 22. His father, Francis, had died. Um, we don't know what from. It might have been malaria. It might have been something else. Um, the wife, Anastasia, was still there in Missouri. The oldest son, Michael, was there. And then Elizabeth and Thomas, the youngest two children, were there on the farm in Missouri. The Corcorans had not gone to California in 1844 with the Murphys. They had remained behind. But in 1847, uh, Thomas apparently contracted what he called lung fever. Today, we would probably call it histoplasmosis, which is caused by a spore that's usually carried in the prairie soils. And those spores, you inhale them into your lungs, and they can germinate and produce a fungal infection. And the symptoms of the more severe cases can be as bad as a really bad case of tuberculosis, and you can die from it. And Thomas, by the time spring of 1848 had rolled around, he was very, very sick. He was coughing up blood. In fact, a doctor told him if he did not go to a dry climate, he was going to die. So Thomas made the decision he needed to get to California. Well, right about that time, in the spring of 1848, this young man, P.B. Cornwall, or Pierre Barlow Cornwall, he and his brother had left Ohio, and they had made the decision that they were, wanted to go to Oregon. And they showed up in St. Joseph's, Missouri, looking for a wagon train to travel west. He found that there were wagon trains forming in St. Joseph's that spring, but they were not planning on leaving for a number of weeks. And Cornwall was a very impatient guy. He wasn't willing to wait. 
And there were a number of mountain men who had previously been to California who were in St. Joseph that were offering their services to be guides. And there was a fellow in St. Joseph at the time by the name of William Fallon. And William Fallon had been to Oregon, he'd been to California. In fact, he had been in California in 1846 at the time of and had participated in the Bear Flag Revolt. He had also been on one of the relief parties to help rescue the Donner Party. But in 1847, Fallon came east and came to St. Joseph's and was offering his services to be a guide. P.B. Cornwall hired Fallon to be his guide to lead him and his brother to Oregon. They had heard that there was a party, an Oregon-bound party forming up in Belleville. And so that's what they did. They left St. Joseph's and they traveled up the same route. And um, so, they, on their way up north to Belleville, they passed through Irish Grove. And somehow, they came in contact with Thomas Corcoran. And it's really kind of interesting that Barlow or Cornwall let Thomas travel with him. Because Thomas, he might have had a mare, and he might have had a rifle, which would have been a value. But he could be a terrible liability and a burden because of his health. And it's just remarkable to me that Cornwall allowed Thomas and agreed to let him travel with him. One of the things that Thomas wrote in one of his letters to his sister, he was kind of reminiscing about that. And here's what he wrote in a letter to Elizabeth. He says, I shall never forget the day I bid you goodbye in March of 1848. I was so sick that you had to saddle my horse for me and help me up. Mother could hardly shake hands with me. She said I would die on the way and have no friend to bury me. So anyway, they, they get to Belleville and they find there is a party of wagons forming at Belleville that's going to go to Oregon, but they too were not planning on leaving for a while. They did discover that there was a Kellogg family in that group who was anxious to get away as well. And so according to the biography written by Cornwall's son years later, he said that uh, P.B. Cornwall, together with his brother Art, and William Fallon, Thomas Corkin, and the Kellogg family decided they would leave. And we think they left Belleville about April the 12th. The Kellogg family was a family of about 14 individuals, and they had four wagons. Thomas made a deal with one of the sons, Joseph Kellogg, that in exchange for a sum of money, Kellogg would carry Thomas's um, blankets and extra clothing in his wagon and would feed him. So anyway, on April the 12th, this family set out from Belleville and headed west. We believe that Caleb Greenwood, the very same guy that had led the Murphys to California two years earlier, had come back to Belleville and was ready to pick up his children. Caleb had married a Crow Indian woman and had a number of children by her. She had passed away, so he had left his younger children behind, and he wanted to take these children back to California in 1848. And he also offered to be the guide for a party of people and about 10 wagons. We think that Greenwood left Belleville a day or two before Cornwall was preceding them. Here's a map that shows Belleville. This is the trail that follows the north side of the Platte River through what today would be Nebraska. Until they got to a location near what today would be Kearney, Nebraska, where they crossed over and went over to the south side. This is where the wagon parties coming up from either Independence or St. Joseph's would come up and join that trail. Of course, many of you have seen pictures of covered wagons before. Um, this is an artist that does a really nice job. This is an image of camp life, also at night. Um, Thomas wrote in his letter to his sister, he said, I had a long and tedious journey. My cough was very, very bad. I coughed up blood until I got to the Rocky Mountains. Every night we would stand guard in two-hour shifts. After I stood guard for about a week, 
The boys went to the wagon train captain and told them that I coughed so much at night that they would stand my guard for me, so I didn't have to stand guard, uh, night guard anymore. So that kind of shows how, how bad off he was. Okay, once they got on the so south side of the Platte River, they were proceeding west and encountered a party of Pawnee Indians. Now, the Pawnees lived in that general area, and for years and years and years, they had been hunting around the Platte River, what they call the forks of the Platte River, because of a very rich buffalo hunting grounds. The Sioux in recent years had moved down from the north, from the Black Hills, and spent a lot of time around Fort Laramie. But the Sioux also discovered what a wonderful hunting ground for buffalo that area was and decided to claim it for themselves. So starting in about the 1830s, the Sioux and the Pawnee were constantly at war with each other, fighting over this prime uh, buffalo hunting ground. Well, it turns out that as the Cornwall party is heading west, they encounter this party of Pawnees. Now, the Pawnees, from the accounts written by people traveling with the Caleb Greenwood party a day or two earlier, those accounts said they had encountered a party of Pawnees. And the Pawnees had molested them, had stolen much of their livestock, and were trying to steal other things from them. The Greenwood party hastened forward until they came to a camp of Sioux warriors. And they told the Sioux about the Pawnees. The Sioux then mounted their horses and ran off to attack the Pawnees. And so what happened is a little bit disclosed by what Thomas Corcoran wrote in his letter to his sister. He said, on the Platte River, the Pawnee Indians were trying to steal from us. They kept shooting around us all day. We traveled all night to get to the Sioux Indians who were friendly with the whites. I slept in a wagon part of the night with my rifle and pistol by my side. Other men rode on either side of the wagons. At daybreak, the sleeping men were awakened and rode guard while the others slept. I walked about a mile ahead of the wagon train and saw Indians coming toward us. I hurried back to the camp and told them what I had seen. We corralled the wagons and made a line of defense. We had an interpreter with us by the name of Fallon who went to meet them. They told him that they had been fighting with the Sioux that morning and about 60 of their tribe had been killed. They said we must give them provisions and clothing, but we told them we had nothing to give. They had their bows strung and were all ready to fire on us. They were all around us and each of us had a pistol in one hand and a rifle in the other waiting to see who would fire first. They got around in front of the wagon in which I had slept and one of them took hold of my blankets and was going to carry them off. I got up on the tongue of the wagon and pushed him away. Then we leveled our rifles at them and they took to their heels and ran. We hitched our teams to the wagons and drove to the Sioux camp and arrived that evening. Um, <clears throat> that party, the Cornwall party, then followed the Sioux all the rest of the way to Fort Laramie for protection. Um, they were now passing, as they were approaching the forks of the Platte River, a massive herds of buffalo. And according to Thomas, in one of his letters, he wrote about buffalo hunting. He said, sometimes five or six of us would get on our horses in the morning and help hunt buffalo all day. About sundown, we would strike out for the wagons, bringing plenty of fresh meat for the whole party for supper, breakfast, and dinner. When we came to the south fork of the Platte, I came across a band of buffalo and ran a calf down and caught it with my rope. Slipper, my mare, threw me, and when I recovered, the buffalo were bellowing all around me. I got on my horse and got safely away and struck out for the camp. When I got to the south fork, the oxen teams were already across the river. The river was about a half mile wide and looked like a running sea of water. I was a little frightened for I could not swim. I ventured in and found that it did not average more than three or four feet deep. So I got to the other side in safety. <coughs> there is an artist by the name of William Henry Jackson 
who had traveled in wagon trains in the 1850s, and he became later a prominent Western photographer. But he was also a pretty accomplished artist, and he, in the 1870s, painted a whole series of paintings depicting locations along the Oregon Trail. And this is one of his paintings. And it shows the crossing of wagon parties at the, the south fork of the Platte River. And you can see it is about a quarter of a mile wide and three to four foot deep. This is uh, another painting by another artist that shows a wagon party with their oxen pulling them. And what's neat is that this now shows the kind of country. They were starting to get into more arid country where grass was now giving way to sagebrush. And you can see sagebrush on either side. So this is kind of terrain that looks kind of close to the kind of um, terrain that they would be traveling across as they're traveling from the south fork of the Platte up to the north fork of the Platte. All right. This map then shows where they cross over. This is about where Oglala, Nebraska is. They would cross over this neck of land and then reach the North Fork and they would travel along the North Fork of the Platte River and start, in to get, start getting into really geologically interesting country where places like Courthouse Rock and Chimney Rock are. This is another William Henry uh, Jackson painting showing wagon parties descending, <coughs> getting ready to circle their wagons for the night. And off in the distance, of course, you see Chimney Rock. This is, a, this is another painting of his of Chimney Rock. And then this is my photograph of Chimney Rock. Um, what's interesting about that is um, from so-called best estimates, they think this Chimney Rock at the time these wagon parties were coming through was about 80 foot taller than it is today. Over the years, it's been blasted by bolts of lightning. <laughs> I've been knocking pieces off of it from time to time. Now, eventually, about three more days later, about May the 10th, the Cornwall party uh, makes it to Fort Laramie. And Fort Laramie had originally been established in 1834 uh, by the American Fur Company as a trading post in um, in 1841, when the Bartleson party came through, they were just in the process of building this fort with adobe brick. And uh, this drawing was drawn by a, a man who was on his way to California in 1849. So this drawing would have taken place one year after Thomas Corcoran came through here. Um, we understand that the Greenwood party was there at Fort Laramie when the Cornwall party arrived. And I think because of the experience both of these rather small parties had had with Indians, they decided to wait. They were going to wait for another party to come along that they could join that would allow them to travel in larger numbers and therefore in greater safety. And it was really about three weeks later that the next party came along. This is, uh, by the way, another picture of Fort Laramie a few years later. Um, this would be a depiction of the adobe brick Fort Laramie, but by now the army had bought the land for the American Fur Company and had been building structures, became the future home of the 7th Cavalry. And in the 1870s, it was a base for the 7th Cavalry operations against the Sioux Indians. All right, so about June the 3rd, um, the Wamba com Company arrived <coughs> from St. Joseph's. And um, this might have been one of the companies that was being formed in St. Joseph when Cornwall came through there. But obviously you can see they didn't even leave St. Joseph's until April 27th, which was about two weeks after these parties left Belleville. Wamba had previously been in California. James Kleiman was an old fur trapper. He had been in California before. And so um, these three parties decided to form together and consolidate, and they would, from that point forward, travel together. And um, 
Wambaugh was leading a rather large party of 40 wagons, so you would have had 10 plus 4 plus 40, so it would have been a party of about 54 wagons. We have the benefit of Riley Root was traveling this party. He kept a day-by-day -day diary, so he was very helpful in seeing, you know, on what date they were reaching certain points and various things that happened. <coughs> There's a picture of James Kleiman. James Kleiman, when he, once he got to California, he settled in Napa Valley. Here's a, a early photograph of a large wagon train to give you an idea what a larger wagon train may have looked like. So they left Fort Laramie and continued to travel west, northwest, traveling in somewhat close proximity to the North Platte River. And eventually they got to near where Casper, Wyoming is today, and then they crossed over to the west side or north side of the Platte River. Okay, here's where they would have crossed over near Casper. Then they traveled through this area, which is very bleak, uh, a lot of alkali. The water, the streams are highly alkaline and very toxic to livestock, and you had to take pains to make sure your horses, your oxen, your mules did not drink the water or they'd die. They um, eventually made it to Willow Springs, which is about 25 miles between this point and this point. Willow Springs was their first place uh, in almost a day of finding some really good quality water. There is a picture I took a few years ago of Warm Springs out in the middle of nowhere. This is an interesting Google Earth picture of that area. This would be Willow Springs right here. This is a gravel county road that you can follow. But what you can see, and I know some of you probably can't see it from where you're sitting, this, you see this faint line trace through here. These are evidence of old wagon ruts as they would climb the hill or the, the ridges up to the top. You can drive back and there's a plaque back here and you can see the wagon, the deep wagon ruts that have been carved through this sagebrush covered terrain. About 20 miles beyond this point, they came to Independence Rock. Independence Rock is a, you know, a famous, famous landmark, landmark, landmark along the trail. It's an enormous granite rock that rises up out of the surrounding land, about a quarter of a mile long, about 150 feet high. And it had, uh, this was another painting of William Henry Jackson. This is my photograph of Independence Rock. Um, it was named Independence Rock because it was apparently named by a group of trappers that came through in about 1825 and it happened to be here on July the 4th and they called it Independence Rock. And between then and the 1820s with the fur trappers and then the, all the gold rush people that passed by this rock in the years to come, a lot of these people would carve their names, chisel their names on this rock and as huge as this rock is, you can walk around it, walk up it, and hardly find a spot where there isn't a name carved in. It's an, uh, absolutely amazing. It's referred to, I think Father DeSmet in 1841 was calling it the Register of the Desert. This is just beyond Independence Rock is Devil's Gate, and Devil's Gate then leads you into the Sweetwater River Valley. Here's a photograph facing west, overlooking the Sweetwater River Valley. Um, for the next 100 miles, these wagon trains would travel up this valley besides the Sweetwater River, which was good, plenty of good grass and good water. And at the far end of this 100-mile valley would be the Continental Divide or South Pass where you would get over to the other side. This is a picture of part of this, shows the Sweetwater River meandering through the valley. This is a picture of South Pass. Like I said, it's the Continental Divide. The Rocky Mountains, they, you know, they start down in New Mexico, Colorado, and go all the way up into Canada. They're high and they're rugged. And this is as bad as it is. I mean, you can get up over the Continental Divide or the Rocky Mountains really easy with wagons. It's just a gentle incline and then you get to the other side and it's a gentle decline. It's almost like God created an easy path for the Americans to head west.
All right, from South Pass, from South Pass, um, they went down across kind of a 40 mile deserty area over a range of hills and then down into the Bear River Valley, which is in today's Idaho, and ended up camping um, one night at Soda Springs. And um, Thomas had something to write about. He said, when we came to Soda Springs, Fallon and Guthrie said they knew a cutoff that would shorten the distance 200 miles. They knew all the Rocky Mountain country as they had been trading and trapping in this country for the last 25 years. They were going to start next morning as they were tired of stopping and traveling so slow with the ox-drawn wagons. They coaxed me to go with them. I agreed. The three of us were to start at 6 o'clock the next morning. I had bought an Indian pony to carry my clothes and other things. They came after me at the appointed time, but I was asleep. Fallon asked Parks, that was the man who he was traveling with at the time, to wake me, but Parks made some excuse and said that I would not be able to stand the trip. When I awoke, Fallon and Guthrie were gone. I had never slept as long as I did that morning. We heard no more of Fallon or Guthrie until we got to the Truckee River. Some Indians told us that there were two men who came ahead of us and that they had had a fight with the Indians for two days. The Indians corralled them in a bunch of timber. They were never heard from again. And it's kind of ironic that this lung fever, which could have caused his death, may have actually saved his life. It's kind of interesting. The other thing that came out in this, there's two, two points I want to make regarding this incident. When those wagon parties consolidated at Fort Laramie, you now had Wamba, who knew the way to California, you had Greenwood, who knew the way to California. You had Fallon, who knew the way to California. And you had James Kleiman. So you had four people that really knew the way. So you kind of wonder what was the dynamics that was going on there. Who was going to be the boss? Who was going to be submissive, sub, you know, replaced? And it's obvious Fallon probably said, what am I doing here? I don't need to be plodding along with these wagons. They're not using me as a guide anymore. And so we're just going to go ahead and ride on ahead, which was an unfortunate decision he made. The other thing I, I wanted to point out, Thomas refers to this guy by the name of Parks. His name was David Parks. What had happened at Fort Laramie is that Joseph Kellogg, who had been carrying his blankets and feeding Thomas, had apparently decided he didn't want to do that anymore. And there was a man in the Wambaugh party by the name of David Parks who agreed to, in exchange for a dollar fifty a week, would carry his blankets and would feed him. And so David Parks is the one that was kind of responsible for saving Thomas's life. And we're going to hear more about David Parks later. All right, they continued on from Soda Springs to Fort Hall. Fort Hall was a trading post belonging to the Hudson's Bay Company. It was right along the Snake River there in Idaho. And from there, from Fort Hall, they proceeded westward. Where's Fort Hall? Okay, here's Fort Hall. They proceeded along the, the Snake River until they got to the Raft River or near the Raft River. And then the, the trail forked. Those wanting to go to Oregon would continue on, and this would be the Oregon Trail that would take them there. If you wanted to go to California, you took a left turn and traveled up the Raft River, then Cassia Creek, and past the City of Rocks. There's an image of the City of Rocks. And then, they would travel by the City of Rocks and then up Goose Creek over Thousand Springs Valley over a summit and then descend down into this is now into Nevada to near the headwaters of the Humboldt River. Okay, we're up here and that's near Wells, Nevada. From here on the trail to California would pretty much follow the Humboldt River which also is pretty much paralleled by Interstate 80. Those of you who've driven 
by Interstate 80, take you by where today's Elko would be, Battle Mountain. There's a picture of the Humboldt River. And then continuing along uh, in close proximity to the Humboldt River, you get by what today Winnemucca is, then you come down and head south, and you come near where Lovelock, Nevada is. Um, and they get to here, which is the Humboldt Sink. This is where the Humboldt River would finally, it's landlocked, it would just die, it would evaporate. And in those days, there's, there's kind of what the trail would look like across that terrain, pretty bleak. Oxen were starting to get really, really thin and weak because of a lack of grass in recent, year, uh, year, recent months, weeks. Here's an example of where a wagon that had been abandoned in that kind of country, and that's about all that's left is just a little bit of iron. This is, uh, this is where the Humboldt Sink is. In those days, it was just an alkaline marsh. Today, so much water is diverted out of the Humboldt River upstream that there's so little water that comes in that there really isn't much of a lake at all. It's mostly just a dry alkali bed, lake bed. And so from here, they would head across a, what they call a 40-mile desert toward the Truckee River. Okay, so here's, here's where they would head toward the Truckee River. The Truckee River would come down out of Lake Tahoe through Truckee, down the Truckee River Canyon by where today Reno would be and then make a turn into Pyramid Lake. So after traveling 40 miles across a waterless desert, the wagon party would get to the Truckee River. Well, it just so happened that when they, the, the party that Thomas Parkin was traveling with encountered the Truckee River, something very interesting happened. Here's what he wrote. When we came to the Truckee River, we heard of the discovery of gold in California. All right, here's what had happened. Um, there were a group of Mormons that had come west to California in 1846 as part of the Mormon battalion that were going to be used to help conquer California from the Mexicans. Well, that was a pretty short-lived fight, and so by the end of 1847, all of the members of the Mormon battalion were discharged right in California, basically told you're free to leave. Well, um, Brigham Young told the Mormons still in California, says, stay in California, get jobs, earn money. And when you got some money, buy some supplies, and then head east and come to Great Salt Lake, where we're going to be settling. And so that's what a lot of these Mormons were doing in 18, spring of 1848. And four of these Mormons actually were employed by John Sutter to help build his lumber mill up on the American River at Coloma. And James Marshall had these four men digging a mill race, and of course that's where they discovered gold. And these four Mormons would have been present when James Marshall picked those first early nuggets out of the bottom of that mill race. And of course James Marshall told them, don't tell anybody. Well, of course that's the first thing they did. They told all their Mormon friends. And so the Mormons got really busy and started accumulating quite a bit of gold. And by midsummer, this party of 40 Mormons um, went to John Sutter and bought a bunch of wagons and horses and oxen and supplies, and I think even four small cannon, and said, we're heading to the Great Salt Lake to rejoin our families. They heard all the bad stories about Donner Pass. And they didn't want to go that way. They'd heard that John C. Fremont had found a better way across the Sierras. And so what they did, they left Sutter's Fort and headed east and traveled through near where Placerville is today and continued up these ridges and wound around. And this ended up becoming known as Carson Pass. And if any of you have been on Highway 88 over to the Carson Valley, that is their route. And then they came down through the Carson Valley, followed the Carson River, and then they went north to the Truckee River. And that is where that group of 40 Mormons on in about, I think it was August, uh, yeah, it was August the 15th, encountered this very first wagon party, Wambaugh, Cornwall, uh, and 
Greenwood and told him about, told him two things. Gold's been discovered in California and we found a better way over the Sierras. And we would urge you to try our way. All you have to do is just follow our wagon tracks back. And so <coughs> that's what happened is Wambaugh, Greenwood, Cornwall, they took their wagons and retraced the route of the mountains. And these, these guys would have been actually the very first wagon party to come into California by way of Carson Pass. However, Thomas Corcoran did not do that. Thomas Corcoran was a bachelor. He had his mare, slippers, and he had a pack horse with him. <coughs> and he joined up with Britton Greenwood. Britton would have been Caleb Greenwood's oldest son. And Britton would have been with Greenwood in California at the time of the Donner Party. And Britton actually led one of those relief parties up to save the Donner Party. So here's what Thomas wrote in his letter to his sister about this situation. When we came to the Truckee River, we heard of the discovery of gold in California. I left the wagon train with a man named Greenwood. I gave him one of my horses and we started for the gold diggings. The first night, we stopped in the Sierra Mountains at Donner Camp. It was here that about half of the emigrants died of starvation during the winter of 1846-47. The next morning, Greenwood showed me six or seven of the skulls lying around. That night, he told me the most horrible story about the starving party. He was set by Captain Sutter to pilot relief parties to the sufferers. He showed me where three of his toes had been frozen off. That's what told you that that was Britton Greenwood he's talking about, because that's what had happened to Britton. He had lost three toes to frostbite. The first time they took all of those who were able to travel, as well as the young folks and children, they left several of them behind. And when we came back again, or when they came back again, Mrs. Donner was dead. So from from Donner, uh, and obviously the reason that Britton Greenwood and and Thomas were traveling this route is, I'm sure Britton said, "We want to get to the gold country. I know the way because my dad and I we've been over this Donner Pass many times." We don't have wagons holding us back. We can get over there really quick. And that's exactly what they did. So Th Thomas wrote, he says, we left Donner Camp next morning about six o'clock and traveled till noon. We were descending a steep hollow when we came to a camp of men from California who were going to meet their relatives that we had left behind us in the wagon train. They were the first to show us gold dust. Next day we arrived at Johnson's Ranch on the Bear River. See if I can show you that. When, the, when uh, immigrants came down out of the Sierras after crossing at Donner Pass, they would come down the Bear River, and there's a place called Johnson's Ranch, which was kind of a little trading post. It's a little bit east of where the town of Wheatland is today. So he said, they arrived at Johnson's Ranch. I bought a hundred weight of flour for $16, some dried beef, a pick shovel, and a tin pan. Then we traveled 16 miles to the Yuba River. So they would have traveled up here to the Yuba River where they proceeded to start looking for gold. Here's what he said. He said, I turned out Slipper and the pack horse to graze and went to mining. I used to wash from one to four ounces a day. I was so taken up with the gold that I never thought of Slipper. So I went to look for her and my Indian pony pack horse, they had strayed away. I never saw either of them again. I sold an overcoat for six ounces of gold. I sold my rifle to an Indian for $100. I had worked there for three weeks and got together about $1,000 in gold dust. So that would have been by then about October 1. Then he said, I got a chill and a fever and I made up my mind to go south and see some acquaintances that came from Missouri in 1844. Well, he's talking about the Murphys. As I was hunting for my horses, I came across my old friend, David Park, where he is living in what is still known as Park's Bar. He had just got to the mines. I told Park about the loss of my two horses. He told me that he had a fine mare that he would let me have if I would take care of her during the winter. He told me that if I should lose her, I was to pay him $200 whenever I should see him. 
I never saw him afterwards, but I saw his wife in Sacramento two years later, and I paid her the $200. So then he headed south for Sutter's Fort. And when he got to Sutter's Fort, he discovered that the man kind of running Sutter's Fort was Edmund Bray. Edmund Bray was an Irishman that had lived in Irish Grove and had come out in 1844. He said, I used to know Ed in Missouri. He came here with the Murphys in 44 and he was very glad to see me. He had the keys to the fort. He put my horse in the stable and I stayed with him overnight. The next morning I started for Martin Murphy's ranch on the Consumas River, approximately 20 miles south of Sacramento. I had gone no more than one mile when I felt in back of my saddle where my clothes were tied and I found that the bundle containing my gold dust was gone. I rode back to the fort thinking I would find it, but I never did. I had lost everything except the hundred dollars I had brought from home. Okay. He um, went from Sutter's Fort South to Martin Murphy's. Martin Murphy was one of the older brothers of the Murphy brothers. When he got to Martin Murphy's, he learned that the two younger brothers, John Murphy and Daniel Murphy, were up in the hills, up in this area, getting rich. Um, by the way, that's a picture of Britton Greenwood. I forgot to show you that before. Um, Sutter's Fort, John Sutter. All right, here's Martin Murphy Jr., who had a ranch at that time on the Kasumas River. And then these are images of John, John Murphy and Daniel Murphy. Daniel Murphy was the same age as Thomas. In fact, these two in Quebec had had their first Holy Communion together. <coughs> so Thomas found these two guys down in this area. Um, when gold had been discovered in January of 1848, news spread, and there were some Americans here, but not a huge number of Americans. And so everybody ran to the hills looking for gold. And these guys were no different. And they came down in this area, and they got into this Coyote Creek area near where Murphy's, the town of Murphy's is, and apparently there was a lot of gold there in the bottom of that creek. And in those early, early days, those people that were looking for gold that soon, it was really just a matter of picking these nuggets out of the bottom of these creek beds. <coughs> it was only later when this was all gone that people had to start looking for things like gold dust. But the story is that the Murphy boys were very shrewd and they engaged the services of the local Indians. And they would go to probably Sutter's Fort and load up on blankets. And they would come back here and they would offer the Indians for every cup of gold nuggets they would bring in, they would get a blanket. And it was said by the end of that winter of 1848, the Murphys carried $1.5 million worth of gold out of this area. And the estimate of $1.5 million, in those days gold was selling for $20 an ounce. You're talking 12 troy ounces per pound. And so that translates, that value translates into about 6,500 pounds of gold. That's a lot of gold. And if each pack horse could carry 300, they'd need at least 20 pack horses loaded to the gills to carry that much gold out. So in just roughly six months, those Murphys, and if you take the amount of that gold and multiply it by the value of gold today, that's about $145 million. The Murphys almost overnight became easily the most wealthy family in all of California. And they didn't stick around. These Murphy boys didn't stick around and weren't involved in the gold business much after. They didn't need to. They invested most of that money buying up a good share of the Santa Clara Valley. Yeah. Sunnyvale, like Martin Murphy Jr., he started the town of Sunnyvale, um, where Palo Alto is, all of that was all owned by the Murphys by, by 1849 and 1850. It was amazing. Um, Daniel Murphy, the younger of the brothers, same age as Thomas, 
He, it is said that at one time he owned as much as one million acres of land and a million head of cattle. Unbelievable. This is a picture of John Sullivan. He was one of the Sullivans that came out in 1844. The story about him is that an Indian brought to him a five pound nugget of gold. And he took it to San Francisco and sold it for $25,000. He took that money and bought up vacant lots in San Francisco. And he ended up obviously becoming a very, very wealthy real estate investor in San Francisco. And there's an interesting connection with, even with John Sullivan. John Sullivan, in later years, he had a son, Frank Sullivan, who married another woman by the name of Alice Phelan. And the Phelan family and the Sullivan family <coughs> who were very, were very wealthy, and their daughter Gladys married my grandmother's oldest brother, Richard. And the, there's a tremendous amount of real estate in um, San Francisco today that is owned by the Alice Phelan Sullivan Corporation. And there's now 58 members of the family that are shareholders of that family corporation. And I don't think any of them have to work. They get nice little checks every month from the family corporation. But it all stems originally from that original investment. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. Anyway, Thomas goes on and says that um, after he found you know, John and Daniel Murphy, he says, my friends loaned me money to buy two pack horses and supplies. Um, he bought blankets, clothing, and shoes. He took them to sell to the miners in the Woods Creek area. Woods Creek is where Jamestown runs through where Jamestown is. And he sold the blankets at $75 a piece and the shoes at $16 a pair. He said in a short time he had, he had earned enough money to pay back his loan to the Murphys and had plenty of extra money. And so he upgraded and bought some freight wagons and started hauling supplies into the mining camps in even, even larger amounts. There's a family story that one time he was hauling two wagon loads of flour to the mining camps. He came to a creek that was flooded because of heavy rains. He unhitched his teams, swam them across, and then used a long rope to tow the wagons across the stream. The water penetrated the flour, but not very deep, so he just set them out in the sun and they dried out, and he had plenty of dry flour to sell to the miners at a dollar a pound. He also tells a story that when he was doing some of his own mining, he said he and a number of his companions were mining in the bed of a creek, and a party of New Englanders came along and asked where was the best place to dig. He said that his friends had no love for these Yankees, so they suggested that they dig at the top of a hill knowing full well where it was the last place you'd find any gold. So the Yankees followed their advice, went to the top of the hill, and found an, you know, an enormously rich pocket of gold dust. <laughs> now, is that Yankee Hill just above Columbia? We don't know, but it could be. <clears throat> In 1852, um, my great-great-grandfather, Owen Corcoran, who still lived in Wisconsin. He was married to Catherine. Catherine had a younger sister, Bridget. So the story is, is that Owen and Catherine and Bridget came down the Mississippi River to New Orleans, took a steamship, crossed the isthmus of Panama, came up the west coast to San Francisco, and brought Bridget to meet Thomas. It might have been an arranged marriage, don't know, but anyway, Thomas married Bridget, and that's where we now have the two brothers married to the two sisters. Um, in 1853, maybe 1855, we're not sure. Uh, by the way, that's a picture of my great-great-grandfather, Owen Corcoran. Anyway, Thomas built this stone store in San Andreas. The store is located on Main Street, which would be along here, and St. Charles Street, which is now Highway 49 along here. In um, later years, there's a photograph of it. The building was still there. A few things changed. 
And a recent photograph will show you that that building was torn down in order to make way for widening of Highway 49, but that is still part of the old stone walls of that building. There's another interesting story. In those early days, miners would pay for their supplies with gold dust. And from time to time, Thomas had to take his gold to Stockton to deposit in the bank. And Charles Weber, who was the founder of Stockton, had a bank. He had built a building, was really, from what I understand, was not much more than just a warehouse where he stored people's gold for them. But highway robbers were a problem in those days. So the story is, is that Thomas's wife, Bridget, would bandage one of his feet to make it appear that he was injured so he could say he was going to see the doctor in Stockton. And they would put the gold in the empty boot and hang the boot from the pommel of his saddle. But he did carry a small little bag of gold to give to the highwayman if he was robbed, because the highwayman would expect that he would have some gold. Now, whether he actually got robbed, I don't know. <laughs> You've never heard whether he got robbed or not, but that's apparently what he did. Um, this is an interesting thing that appeared in a newspaper in 1856. And it appeared in a newspaper in Stockton in, in 18, December of 1856. For those of you who are visually impaired like I am, I'm going to read it for you. It says, $50 reward, stolen from the ranch of the subscriber on the San Joaquin River, one mile west of Bonzel's Ferry, on or about the 13th of November, two horses, one a large size gray Mexican horse branded with a heart on the hip and about seven years old. The other was a Mexican horse, roan color, branded with an L on the left hip. The above reward will be given for information that will enable the owner to recover his horses. Signed, Thomas Corcoran, San Andreas, December 1856. That tells me that in addition to being a store owner, he probably raised livestock maybe horses. I found the location, more or less the area on the west side of the San Joaquin River, be west of Lathrop, which would be where Bonsall's Ferry was. That was kind of swamp and overflow. That would be subject to flooding. He may have owned that ranch. He may have just leased it. It may not have belonged to anybody. He may have just pastured livestock there. But we do know he had a stable because in 1858, he uh, I'll get to that in a minute. In, um, in 1858, there was a fire in San Andreas, and the newspaper reported the fire. And it was in June of 1858. And it listed the buildings that had been burned in the fire. And it said one of the buildings that burned was Thomas Corcoran's stable. Um, it did say that his stone building, it didn't burn, per se, but the contents inside worth about $35,000 burned. Um, a year earlier, Thomas had bought 160 acres from Charles Weber. This is a picture of Charles Weber, the founder of Stockton. And um, why did he, why did he um, maybe know Charles Weber? Well, there's a, probably a reason why. This is Charles Weber's wife, Ellen Murphy Weber. Ellen was of the Murphy family. That meant, and Ellen was two years older than Thomas Corcoran. So Thomas would have grown up with her as a next door neighbor in Quebec and Missouri. And they say that Ellen was a very, very attractive young girl. And when she arrived in California, of course, she was unmarried. And I often wondered, did Thomas have a crush on her? We don't know. And was that one of the reasons he wanted to come to California? We don't know. And when he was looking for the Murphys, was he really looking for Ellen Murphy? We don't know. But if and when he did find her, he would have discovered that she was engaged to be married to Charles Weber. And so she did get married to him. The other thing we know about her is that Thomas could not read or write. So these letters that he wrote, he dictated. And he said in one of his letters, that he dictated it to Ellen Murphy, and that she wrote them for him. 
And those would be the letters he sent back to Elizabeth in Wisconsin. And um, I know that Rosie here has said that she has in her possession as a wedding gift given to Thomas Corcoran on his marriage in 1852, a gift from Charles and, and uh, Ellen. And, and that's kind of neat. Um, Thomas went on and bought additional land around that 160 acres, eventually owned about 600 acres, about eight miles east of Stockton. Um, after he sold the store, we do know that he was raising cattle on his ranch, and he had some other hill property that he grazed cattle on. He then opened some butcher shops, and they were in San Andreas that we know of, and there may have been in other locations. He even bragged, well here's, I think I've got it next, yeah here it is. This is a, an advertisement that appeared in the San Andreas newspaper in 1860, I believe, yeah. Corcoran's Market, St. Charles Street, adjoining the engine house, San Andreas, Thomas Corcoran would respectfully inform the public that he will, on Monday, September 17th, 1860, open a new meat market at the above place. I will furnish beef, pork, mutton, etc., fresh every day at reduced prices. So he was involved in that for some un undetermined period of time. Then in 1875, we know that he had his picture taken. This is his picture. I've talked to you about that before. Uh, with the, he had his picture taken with the Society of California Pioneers. Um, it was, by the way, it was just shortly after this picture was taken. Thomas did travel back to Wisconsin and other locations to visit some of his relatives. He hadn't seen them in a long time. And then after his trip, he wrote some follow-up letters to his sister, kind of reminiscing on some more things. Um, in 1885, well, he and his wife Bridget had seven children. They lost four in childhood, had three survivors, Frank, who these wonderful people are descendants of, and two daughters. Um, it's really unthinkable for, you know, it was more common in those days. We're not used to that nowadays, but to lose that many children in childhood had to have been very, very tough on them. In 1885, his wife died, Bridget died, and he by now had uh, bought some land and some houses uh, in Santa Cruz. And he was older, and his son Frank was old enough now to start looking after the ranch. Um, by the way, the ranch, I think, went from raising cattle to raising wheat. Um, this is a picture provided me by Rosie um, of his ranch. And you can see teams of horses pulling a combine. That would generally indicate maybe taken in the 1880s. That would have been about when those combines had come on the scene. He, in his letters, he was bragging to his sister about how they were obtaining about 10,000 bushels of wheat off of his 600 acres. And I did the math. I figured that was about 1,000 pounds of wheat per acre. And you could tell he was very proud of that. Now, I'm a wheat farmer. I'd be very disappointed to get less than 6,000 pounds. In other words, today, with our modern day varieties and our fertilization, our irrigation, you know, we can produce six times per acre what they could in those days. Um, then uh, Thomas wrote to his sister in 1892, which was about seven years after his wife had died. He says, <coughs> I cannot paint now. My hand is too numb. Excuse me, my voice is getting, let me get some water. He said, I did not know that I could be an artist but I took to painting because I got so lonesome when my wife died. I thought it would be better company for me than in saloons. I cannot bear, bear to live at home since she died. So anyway, I guess um, Thomas became a kind of an accomplished artist, particularly when he was living in Santa Cruz. 
<coughs> this is an interesting picture of him taken about that time. And it's kind of almost like a painting in itself, isn't it? Of a group of artists doing their painting. Anyway, Thomas lived a few more years. He died in 1904 at 79 years of age. He told one other story in probably the last letter they wrote to Elizabeth. He was remembering that when he had traveled to um, Irish Grove in the 1870s, he stopped by the old Corcoran farm and he went and looked for his father's grave. And um, he said it was hard to find because trees had grown up around it. Some old neighbors took him. And he said, um, he said, I had a bad cough. He said, I knelt down to say my prayers. He said, when I got up, he says my cough was gone. He talked to the man who owned the land and tried to see if he'd be willing to sell it to where they could save it as a, preserve it as a cemetery for those people that were buried there, probably including the Murphys, you know, Martin Murphy Sr.'s wife and granddaughter. And then he says in the letter, he says, I came home to California. He says, I talked to the Murphys to see if they would help. He says, no, they weren't interested, didn't think it would do any good. So it's kind of, you could tell he was disappointed. But anyway, he, he signed the letter off and he just said something like, I send my love and hope we will meet in heaven. And he lived about eight more months and passed away. Anyway, I just think Tom Spark was a neat guy. And with all my years of researching him and studying about him, I feel probably a closer kinship to him than I would my own great-great-grandfather. So that's all I have to say. Thank goodness I'm bringing it to an end. I don't know that my voice would have lasted too much longer. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions?